Your name is sweet, oh Lord. Take me, Lord. Take me up.
come with a shout of praise. Lord, we're going up to the high places. We're going to take back everything the devil saw. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Jesus 
Jesus is the Son. I know Jesus is the Holy Ghost. And all these three are one. Let me tell you who Jesus is. something about having revelation of who Jesus really is. There's something to this revelation of who he is that brings a joy and a peace and a comfort to our lives. That song just basically gave you a Bible study, quoted some scriptures and Acts 2.38 tells us that we need to repent. We need to be baptized, every one of us, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then it says, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. The first outpouring of the Holy Ghost. When they asked the question, what must we do to be saved? He said, this is what you got to do. You got to repent. You got to be baptized in his name and you got to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And there's plenty who will argue the fact that I'm not going to get into a doctrine lesson here this morning, although I very easily could. But there's plenty who say, well, that's just what Peter said. I don't know if I want to take Peter's words and acts. I think I'd rather take what Jesus said in Matthew. Okay. Matthew 28, 19 is where a lot of them get their doctrine from that says go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost 
They translate that into a doctrine that that's how I'm supposed to be baptized, but that's not what it says. It says to be baptized in the name. The name is singular. Father, Son, Holy Ghost are titles. And so it's very simply put in Scripture. But let me just help you because the verse just before that, they sang about. Jesus said, all power. Everybody say all. All. Does that mean some? Does that mean a little bit? Does that mean I'm just second in command? I'm the assistant? He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then he, hang on. Then he followed it with, go be baptized in that name. And then Acts 4.12 says, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So let me tell you who Jesus is. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the one true God. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the beginning and He's the ending. Hallelujah. You have you have this reaction when you have revelation. Revelation causes you to act a certain way. If your ball team wins on Saturday, the revelation at the end of the day, at the end of the game, is that they won. The reaction you have to that revelation is you get a little bit excited. What you need to understand is I've got a revelation of who Jesus really is. I haven't been distracted by the world's concepts. I haven't been distracted by religion. I understand who he is. And because of revelation, I have a reaction that says I'm not going to wait till I get to heaven to worship him. I'm going to shout right now. I'm going to worship right now. I'm going to praise right now. Ha. Let me tell you who he is. Ha. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name around and high five somebody say I know who Jesus is amen God bless you you can make your way to your seats it's such an honor here this morning to have all of our guests you can be seated for just a moment have all of our guests here with us today we're so honored to have you here today thank you uh, for taking time out of your schedule to be with us here today We have several guests that are here, some first-time guests, some returning guests, and so uh, we just want to say thank you for being here and being a part. Can we make them welcome to the house of the Lord here today? Amen. We might do things a little different than where you've been before, but that's all right. We have a reaction to Revelation. So, well, that's going to be a good message title right there. We ought to just put that one together. I just gave you the short version of it. You just got the cliff notes. So It's so good to have each and every one of you here with us today. Uh, just let me help a little information. I'm going to help Sister Lisa out. She's got a little project going on, a challenge uh, in her Sunday school class. So if your child is a part of Sister Lisa's Sunday school class, make sure if she hasn't gotten to you already, you see her so you'll understand why there's a dollar coming home in an envelope and it wasn't for candy. So... Uh, there's a little challenge that's been posted, so make sure you understand that for them. Not that, not that your children would tell you something different. They understand the challenge, but not that they at all would tell you a difference or lead you down a wrong path. <clears throat> Just don't go by the dollar store with them, that's all. So make sure you see her. We had a big event take place this week. Some of you that were here Wednesday night, we announced, but uh, announcing here Sunday morning because she is sitting home right now watching Pastor preach. And uh, <clears throat> little Madeline Hewling was born this past Wednesday, nine pounds and two ounces, 21 and a half long. Excited. Amen. So she's, uh, she's watching. I got a picture already this morning. She's watching this morning, although she's doing what most apostolic babies do at the time she was sleeping, but... She had a smile on her face while she was looking at the screen, so we're just, 
Osmosis is working on her this morning, and so we're so thankful. Amen. Been doing a lot of work around here trying to prepare for all these babies that we've got coming along, and we've been working uh, in, in the back there and creating a, an area for them, redoing our nursery, so we've kind of moved it around. So I'm just going to clarify something because I had two questions this morning, and so I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. What I'm currently using for an office right now is going to be our future nursery. We added a bathroom, or we're working on adding a bathroom and a nursing room for all of our uh, newborn babies and the moms and give them a little privacy. And so I just need to clarify that I will be moving my office. <clears throat> the nursing moms will not walk through my office to go to the nursing room. I just needed to clarify that. It was a couple of questions on that. So it's okay. You can laugh. It'll be all right. <laughs> Oh, boy. Let me leave that alone for a minute. Okay. Let's, let's get into the Word. Why don't you turn to your Bibles for me, Acts chapter 19. I'm going to read a few verses to you this morning. So often, I feel so directed here this morning to preach what I have here today, and so I'm just going to ask God to help us for the next little bit and want God just to move in a tremendous way, however He feels to move in this. I don't know if, as Brother uh, Mulling said last week, if we'll be skid marks on the walls and biting the ceiling. I'm not sure what that means, but um, <laughs> uh, but we're just going to see what God has for us today. I, I, I don't know what direction he's headed with this, and so we're just going to give you the word, but Acts chapter 19, so often we find uh, in life, and if you want to stand for the word, uh, the reading, that's, that's respectful, thank you. So often in life, there are people tossed around, unable to establish direction in life. We've all seen them. We've all, maybe even some of us, been that person ourselves. There's seemingly no direction. Going from place to place, one career path to another career path, one uh, type of friend to another type of friend, very restless with life, unable to find their way because there has been no direct path set for them to follow. We've all made some form of this statement, I, I don't know what I want to do or I don't know what I want to be, or uh, even, even more so, I, I just feel lost and I don't know what direction to go. I, I hope to address this today for us, and when you leave here, I hope that you will have decided to live life on purpose, and I've got a purpose and a reason why I'm living this. But let's look at this little story here in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. It says, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he found some church folks there. And he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? What a question to pose to people who seemingly were believers. Obviously, he identified them, knew that they were disciples of some sort. And so he asked them the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now, if you'll notice something in this scripture, not my message today, but something that would really... Uh, stands out and that is simply that immediately he jumps from asking them if they've heard about the Holy Ghost and them saying that they had never heard about it he immediately follows it up with baptism he immediately said unto them unto what then were you baptized how were you baptized if you don't know what the Holy Ghost is then I gotta ask the next question and that is how were you baptized Obviously, seemingly tying together the two and understanding that they, are, they, they go together. And so he said, how were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. And so Paul told them that John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. There's that three steps we just talked about. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized. They were baptized how? In the name of the Lord Jesus. And then in verse number 6, it says, When Paul laid his hand upon them, that the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And so we understand here in this little segment that we came across some people who apparently looked like they were believers. Otherwise, Paul may not have stopped and asked him the question he did. But realizing that they had some other things they needed to do. They hadn't really arrived yet, if you will. There was still some path that they needed to follow. They needed something to show them purpose as they were moving forward. So if you will, just lay your Bibles down and let's pray and ask the Lord to help us here for the next few minutes and ask Him to open up our hearts to receive, our ears to hear. We want God just to move on us here today. Lord, we love you today. 
God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to be in your house. God, this opportunity, Lord, once again to come together. God, your word has gone out across this campus, Lord, today. And God, I pray that as you honor that word, I pray that you'll touch us in the next few minutes. God, open our ears, God, to hear it. God, our hearts to receive it. God, my lips, Lord, to deliver your anointed word, God, we ask. And Lord, we pray that you touch us here today. Whatever you feel, Lord, to do, God, we pray, Lord, that you take your liberty here today in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated here today. Thank you for standing. During the Second World War, German paratroopers invaded the island of Crete. When they landed at Malim, the islanders met them bearing nothing other than basically kitchen knives and some, uh, some, some hay uh, sits that they had. And the consequences of their resistance was absolutely devastating. The residents of the entire villages were lined up and they were executed. They were shot uh, in this time of, of, world, of the Second World War. And then overlooking the airstrip today, the same place where uh, the Germans had paratroopers had landed, when you overlook this airstrip today, it's an institute for peace and understanding that was founded by a Greek man named Alexander Papadiros. Papadiros was just six years old when the war began. His home village was destroyed and he was imprisoned in a concentration camp. And when the war <clears throat> excuse me, ended, he became convinced uh, his people needed to let go of the hatred the war had unleashed on them. So to help this process, he founded his institute in this place that embodied the very horrors and hatreds unleashed by the war in this very airstrip. And one day while taking questions at the end of a lecture... Papadiris was asked this question. He said, what is the meaning of life? There was nervous laughter, as you can imagine, in the room. And it was such a, a weighty question. But Papadiris answered it without hesitation. He opened up his wallet and he took out of his wallet a very small round mirror. And he held it up for everyone to see. He said, during the war, I was a small boy and when he came across a motorcycle wreck. The motorcycle had belonged to German soldiers. And Alexander saw the pieces of broken mirrors from the motorcycles lying on the ground. And so he tried to put them together as best he could, but he couldn't do it. And so he took the largest piece that he found and he scratched it against a stone until its edges were smooth and it was now a round piece of mirror. He used it as a toy, as uh, many of us young boys would have done, fascinated by the way that it could shine light into holes and crevices and it could reflect that light. And he, he kept that mirror with him as he grew up. And over time, it came to symbolize something very important. It became, if you will, a metaphor for what he might do with his life. And here's what he said. He said, I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into dark places of this world, into black places in the hearts of men, and change some things in some people. He said, perhaps others may see and do likewise. This is what I am about. This is the meaning and purpose of my life. In the text that we read, there was a question that was asked to Paul. And if you ask the disciples of John the Baptist, it's a very important question, quite possibly uh, one of the most important questions in our society. It's an important that we are able to answer this all-important question. And there, there are far too many who are traveling a road of life aimlessly, wondering for real purpose and, and real direction in their life. But if you notice the question uh, was asked to people who were believers. Again, he had to identify them in some fashion. And so they were disciples of John and those uh, that were familiar with a message that had been preached by John the Baptist. These people were familiar with it. They were followers of it. And so they understood that. But when they asked if they had been receiving the Holy Ghost, their response was that they hadn't heard about the Holy Ghost yet. And so immediately it's followed up with how were you baptized? And the reason for that is if you've ever been baptized in the name of Jesus, you understand there is power that follows that name. If you've ever been baptized in the precious name of Jesus, you understand it's not just getting wet. 
It's not just a ritual, but something happens. There's nothing in the water. There's nothing special about it. It's just simply the name of Jesus that gets applied. And when the name of Jesus is applied, there's power that follows. So they recognize that. And so believing for them was not enough. They had to go further. There's so many people that say, all you have to do is believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and you're saved. Well, here we find some disciples of John who did just that. They believed as John had taught them. They only had repentance. And so believing was not enough. They had to go even further. See, what you have to understand, having my sins washed away in baptism and receiving his spirit in me through the evidence of speaking in tongues gives me power to live in the world that is around me. It gives me power and authority to survive, if you will, in the world around me. Having that spirit alive in me and, and using it to its fullest potential gives me the ability to be focused and have drive and purpose for my life. I don't know about you, but when the Holy Ghost is alive and vibrant in my life, it gives me direction, it gives me purpose. I can absolutely make my calling and my election sure because of the power of the Holy Ghost living on the inside. I think that the only way an apostolic can exist in the hour in which we live is to live life on purpose. The only way we can survive in the things that are going on around us in the society that we live in is we have got to live our life and live that life on purpose, with direction, with focus. There's too many people who are meandering through life without meaning and they're just plodding along without purpose at all. They're just taking it as it comes and whatever happens, happens. And, and they basically have adopted the advice of the ungodly that's found in Isaiah 22 and 13 where they simply said, let us eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. I have no direction. I have no purpose. I have no focus. I have no, no, no purpose in my life. And so let me just do whatever it is I can do. Just be whatever it is I can be. And I have no direction or focus. I'm convinced, and I preached on this a few weeks ago, that man's main problem is an identity problem. Our issues are that we have an identity problem. We see ourselves as the world has seen us. We see ourselves as insignificant. We live our lives with no significance whatsoever. We live our lives as, as if it has no value or, or no purpose. And if we live our lives that way and we think that we are that way, then we're going to establish ourselves that way. We have an identity issue. The world says that we're just a little bit above the animals. But the Word says we're just a little bit below the angels. <laughs> There's an identity crisis, an identity problem of what the world thinks we are and tells us we should be and what the Word says we are and who we should be. we got to make sure we get it together and understand I have been called by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I have been designated as an ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I understand who Jesus is. I understand who I follow and I understand who I serve. Brother Jeff Arnold shared that, that word angels and that it was used here and it translates Elohim. It, it doesn't mean that it's just created beings, but it is referring to God himself. We're just a little below God who is the image that we were made in. Listen to me, we are a lot higher and a lot loftier than the world estimates us to be. How do you know that's true? Well, Hebrews 2, verses 6 through 9 says this, But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man, that you're mindful of him, or the son of man, that you take care of him? And verse 7 says, You have made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You put things in subjection under his feet, for he uh, put all subjection underneath him, and, and he left nothing that was put under him. But now we do not see all things that are put under him. But verse number 9 says, we see Jesus. Uh, hang on. He just said, who is man that you're mindful of him and take care of him, that you made him a little lower than the angels? And then verse 9 says, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. I'm made in the same image of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
He suffered death. And he's crowned with glory. And he is by the grace of God. He tasted death for everyone. But understand something. I am not what the world has dictated that I am. My identity is not lost. I'm not in a crisis. I understand who I am. I wasn't made to be insignificant. I was made to be just like Jesus. I'm not just a little above the angels or a little above the animals. I'm just below the angels. I've been made in the same image and likeness of Jesus Christ. I wish you'd clap your hands today and understand I have been made in His image. Come on, somebody, anybody excited about being made in the image of an almighty God? God has designs for you. He has designs for me. God has a plan and a purpose for us. And let me tell you something. Evolution has nothing to do with it. Jeremiah 29 and 11, the New Living Translation says it this way. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans of good and not disaster. To give you a future and a hope. I hope you understand that when God created you, He created a plan for you. The enemy can't take you off that plan. Only you can take yourself off that plan. God has a plan. He said, I don't have intentions for it to be disastrous. I don't have intentions for it to be hurting and suffering. I have intentions for it to be good. I've given you a hope. I've given you a future. You just got to live life with a purpose and a direction and a focus. Our world has thrown out the compass of God's infallible truth and pulled down the common boundary lines of godly morals. They have mocked the righteousness of God. The Bible lets us know that this is not going to go unpunished. Our world is striving to be politically correct, yet society has become morally corrupt in the process. There are too many people that are more afraid of being tolerant than they are holding on to truth. Truth is loving someone enough to tell them how they need to live and how they ought to walk. That's really what love is. Tolerance doesn't tell you that, but truth will tell you that. Love will tell you that. There's nothing outside the church that promotes that kind of lifestyle. We are, if you will, a a society within a society. We have to live a distinctively and very different way. And God will give us the power to live with purpose in this present age that we walk in. We have to have a holy boldness to stand for what we believe in and not fall to the trap of trying to compromise. I'll get back to some of this in a second, but I wish I had some apostolics that would say, you know what, I'm going to stand for what I believe in. I don't care what the world tells me I have to look like. I don't care what the outside tells me I have to do. I don't care how they tell me to dress. I don't care how they tell me to walk. I don't care how they tell me to go. I am going to live my life with boldness, stand for what I believe in, and not fall to the trap of compromise. Come on, somebody, I'm not willing to compromise today. I'm not willing to compromise. Now, let me just follow that up. This isn't in my notes, but I feel like I need to say this. I'm not going to compromise, and I'm willing to stand up with boldness, but you better make sure you do it with love and compassion. It is not your place to get in somebody's face and tell them how they should do things and what they should do. It's your place to love them as Christ loved them and died for them and let them see it through your walk and through your life. Just make sure that I got that out there. I've been covering that on Wednesday nights, but I want to make sure I got that out there. Having a boldness is not being rude. Love and compassion. I know what the Bible says, and I believe it's the word of God, and that it is what I want to be the guide for my life. I want it to give my direction. God has never failed. He's not going to fail. And I promise you that's the team I want to be on. I I want to be on the team that every time they're up to play, they look at them and say, there's a 100% chance they're going to win. There's no question. There's no doubt. Because Jesus has never failed, and he's not going to fail. I'm not waiting on it to happen. I'm not expecting it to. Listen, if you'll just get that mentality in your head that God has never failed, nor will he ever fail, it'll change your outlook on how you do things. I'm on the team that doesn't lose. I'm on the team that doesn't walk out. I'm on the team that is successful and strong and victorious. (laughs) Clap your hands to the Lord. (laughs) 
definite de decisions define that we have a destiny. We have to make our daily decisions. We have to live life with purpose. The Bible tells us that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. There, there need to be some men that will echo the cry of Joshua when he said, Choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve him with purpose. We're going to serve him on purpose. We're going to make some decisions with purpose. Our life is not going to just meander around and walk in all sorts of directions. But we are going to get up and we are going to simply say, every day I put my feet on the ground. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. But what if I got a trial to face that day? Doesn't change the fact that this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. But what if I'm having trials on my job? What if I'm having problems in my marriage? What if I'm having problems with my children? It doesn't change the word of God. Today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I got to live with purpose. I got to have some definition in my mind of what I'm going to do each and every day. The individuals that, that uh, uh, if we're going to live for God every day, we're going to have to live righteously every day. The individuals that are going to make it in this last day are going to have purpose in their heart and in their house and uh, their homes. And they're going to have purpose when they come to the house of God. And they're going to be there every time the doors are open. Whenever the word goes forth, I'm going to be there. I've made up my mind that I'm going to come into his gates with thanksgiving. I'm going to be in his courts with praise. I'm going to do it with a purpose. I'm going to live my life on purpose there is an absolute enemy that is called indecision some people will end up in the current the course of the world brother uh, Mullings talked to us about the river just not too long ago and how that river current moves but in, in an old life we were caught up in the course we were caught up in the the current of the world if you will but there are, there are too many people that end up in those kind of places not because the grace of God is insufficient, not because God's power through the Holy Ghost is not able, and not because they don't have the knowledge and the know-how from the scriptures. There are too many men that are tripping up and falling into the current of indecision. I just can't make up my mind. I can't decide what I need to do. There's too many people falling in that current because somewhere along the line, they convince themselves that maybe they can't make it or maybe they can't do it. Let me tell you just a little something and stir up something in your spirit this morning because the word of the Lord says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I got to get out of that problem of indecision. I got to make up my mind. I got to make my calling and my election sure. I'm going to live my life on purpose and with purpose. And I'm going to understand that I can do all things through Christ. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. You got to get your identity right and understand that I'm going to make it. I'm going to live for God. My family's going to be safe. My home's going to be safe. I've got a made up mind. I'm going to live my life on purpose. I like the Gospel of Mark. It's one of those uh, books that just highlights the miracles of Jesus Christ and highlights his power. If you go back and read through the book of Mark and the gospel of Mark, 19 times in the gospel of Mark, you will find the word straightway. Straight away or straightway. Straightway Jesus went into the city. Straightway Jesus went and healed the blind man. 19 different times it is said of Jesus in the gospel of Mark that what he did, he did straightway. Let me just help you for a second. It lets us know that he was on a course. He had a purpose. He had a passion. He was intentional about what he did. Jesus was not just meandering around unsure of what direction to go. Caught up in indecision. He went straight way. He had a purpose. He had a direction. And I'm just telling you here this morning, you had better make up your mind every day. You better have an agenda. The devil, your adversary, absolutely has an agenda. If you don't think he's got an agenda, I'm just letting you understand something. In the spirit realm, there is a battle that goes on for you each and every day, and the devil has an agenda. Every day you get up, the devil's got an agenda. 
Do you know why there's temptation that comes your way? Because the devil has an agenda. Do you know why there's problems that pop up and cause you to be uh, in a position where you maybe feel offended? It's because the devil has an agenda. I told you just several weeks ago, the issue is not the issue. The issue is the devil don't want you to have a relationship with God. He has an agenda each and every day. But I'm here also to let you know that if you'll live your life on purpose, God has an agenda and it supersedes anything the adversary ever came up with. Have you ever been in a situation and you were tempted and you don't know how you got past that temptation? You don't know how you got past it. Let me tell you how you got past it. The devil had an agenda, but God had an agenda that supersedes his. The agenda of the devil is to steal and kill and destroy. And so somebody needs to get bold enough to look the devil in the eye and say, I am going to live my life on purpose. I'm going to live my life like Jesus. Straightway, I'm going to make up my mind. Straightway, I'm going to live for God. Every day is going to be a day that is filled with purpose and passion and focus. Every day, every day. Pastor... Don't you know we make mistakes? Yeah, I know we make mistakes. None of us are perfect. But I also know that the scripture says, if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. I want you to more than, know more than just that. There is a life that you can live with purpose. A life you can live with decision and with destiny. You don't have to be a victim you can walk with God in victory and live for him triumphantly. That is where God wants you to live and dwell in victory and triumph. That's the purpose he has for your life. Look at Psalms 121 verses 1 through 8. It says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord, look, shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even evermore. Somebody say, the Lord is my help. Say, the Lord is my help. He is my help. He is keeping me. He's going to preserve me. I don't have to keep crawling to the altar all the time because I have purpose. I have direction. And I can be one of those that are down in the altar praying with somebody else, letting them understand. Listen, you got direction. You got purpose. There's a way out. There's an avenue you can travel. Don't have a problem understanding that he's our savior, but some of us need to understand that he's also our keeper. If you don't hear anything else I said this morning, make sure you hear this next statement. God is not just big enough to take our sins away. He's big enough to keep you from going back to sin. You need to understand. You got to learn to live your life on purpose. God is not, and we get all excited about this, the fact that God's bigger than my sin and God can wash away my sin and God can take away my sin and all of that is true. But some of us have been caught up in the mentality that all he does is wash sin. You also need to understand he keeps from sin as well. Not only did he deliver me, he can keep me. Separation from the world is, is, is not our problem. It's our privilege. <laughs> Separation from the world is not our problem. It's our privilege. Well, you know, those apostolics, they got to be separated from the world. That's the problem. That's the problem. The problem is they just got to be separated. The problem is they got to do this. The problem is they got to do it. That's not my problem. That's my privilege. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to be an apostolic, Holy Ghost filled individual. Listen to me. If separation is old fashioned, then call me old fashioned. But you'll never get to call me lost because I am going this path of salvation. I'm going to keep living for God. I'm going to continue to walk with God. I have purpose. I have purpose. I have purpose. And it's what drives me. 
We have got to reflect God. We have got to rule, take dominion that we have been given in Scripture. Do you understand? He said you are the head and not the tail. You have got to make sure that you understand. You are the head. You're the one who strikes out with direction. You are not the victim. You are something special in the eyes of the Almighty. You're the head and not the tail. Quit letting the adversary lie to you and tell you you're not. It doesn't matter what society around me tries to tell me. I I don't have to be accepted by the world. The only one I want to be accepted by is the one who died for me. The only one I want to be accepted by is the one who died on a cross and shed his blood for me. So let the world ridicule the power and the authority that I have in him. I know that I have answered the most important question, if you will, in the world. Have you received the Holy Ghost? Yes, I have. And it gives me strength to make it through the challenges and the struggles of life. I have purpose. I have direction. I am living my life on purpose. I'm going to close here this morning if the music will prepare. I want you to understand something. I, I am an individual who always has to have an agenda. My family will tell you. I got to have a schedule. I got to know what's happening next. I can't, I have a very difficult time. We took our first vacation this past year with no agenda. It was a great vacation, but I was stressed out. What are we doing next? Where are we going to go today? You mean we're not doing anything? We're just sitting here. Because that's my personality. That's my makeup. I've got to know where we're going, where we're headed. Some of you need to get that personality in your walk with God. And you need to say, you know what? As for me and my house, this is what we're going to do. I'm not going that way. I'm going this way. I'm not going to fall off this way. I'm going in the right direction. I'm living my life on purpose. I'm going to celebrate everything that God has done. I'm going to worship Him every opportunity I get. And I'm going to live my life with purpose. Hebrews 13 and 5 says this, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that you have. We talked about that a week or so ago. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He himself has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. If you could just wrap your mind around the fact that no matter what valley you go through, No matter what dark place you go through, no matter what challenge you go through, he has said, I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you. Whatever hurt you go through, whatever pain you go through, whatever situation you face, it's the same scripture and it still applies. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. You have got to stop worrying about what's going to happen next. See, when you just live your life, however... You're always worried about what's next. You're always worried about what's coming around the next corner. You're always worried about what I'm going to have to face tomorrow. You're always worried about, I got a cough today, what's happening tomorrow. Let me be real with you. You're always worried about, oh, I feel something, I don't know what that is, and you start worrying about it. I'm not telling you to be silly and don't get things checked out. What I'm telling you is trust God sometimes. We've gotten far away from trusting God. We start trusting in our own decisions and our own thought process. And let me tell you something. Every time we trust in our own thought process and our own decisions, it messes up. But if I live my life on purpose and I have direction and I have focus that God will never leave me, he's never going to forsake me, then it doesn't matter what valley I am in right now. I know where to find my strength. When I live life on purpose, I have no fear of what tomorrow may hold because I know where to find my strength. Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5, and then several other times, there's some recognition that happens in here. And I want you to see something here today as I close with this. And it talks about in the very beginning, this is the very beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and there was darkness on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And oddly enough, God spoke it. And guess what happened? There was light. God saw the light and that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and he called the darkness night. And so look what it says. The evening and the morning were the first day. Again, in verse number eight, God called the firmament heaven. And so the evening and the morning was the second day. 
verse 13 says, so the evening and the morning were the third day. And verse 19 says, so the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And then verse 23 says, so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And then it says in verse 31, then God saw everything he had made and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Does anybody notice anything about that pattern of scriptures? Anything noticeable about that? It wasn't how we classify a day. We classify a day by morning and evening. It said over and over, evening and the morning. See, what you have to understand here this morning, and this is where I want you to get it, stand with me if you will. This is what I want you to grab a hold of here this morning. Every one of those scriptures said the evening and the morning were that next day. The sun always rises on what God has created. He works through the night to bring the light of a new day. What you need to understand is that the devil may try to trap you on the evening. But that's where God is creating is in the evening. It may be evening when you struggle, but understand that's where God is creating. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. It may be the evening where you're fighting, but know that's where God is preparing a victory. It may be the evening where the enemy tries to overwhelm you with fear and with doubt, but know that is where God is supplying you with peace and joy and strength and confidence. The enemy may be trying to trap you in the evening, but God is in the middle of creating your joy, your peace, your strength, your hope. And when the sun rises on that next day, when the sun rises, you're going to realize the whole time God has been creating the evening and the morning. Psalms 30 verses 1 through 12 this is going to be the last place that I read I'm reading from the New Living but you can follow along with me I will exalt you Lord for you rescued me you refused to let my enemies triumph over me oh Lord my God I cried to you for help and you restored my health verse 3 says you brought me up from the grave, oh Lord, you kept me from falling into a pit of death. Verse 4, sing to the Lord, all you godly ones, praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Your day will always end with joy. Evening and morning was the next day. Your day is not going to end in hurt. Your day is not going to end in pain and suffering. But your day is going to end with the light shining, with the joy facing you. That's what God has created for you. When I was prosperous, he said, I said, nothing can stop me now. I lived life with a purpose. Your favor, O oh Lord, made me secure as a mountain. He said, when you turned from me, I was shattered. I cried out to you, O oh Lord. I begged for the Lord for mercy, saying, will you again if I... What will you gain if I die, I, if I sink into the grave? Can the dust praise you? Can it tell you of your faithfulness? And then he says, hear me, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Help me, O Lord. Verse 11, you have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have uh, taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy that I might sing praises to you and not be silent Oh, Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. I wish you would see what it says. You turn my mourning into 
dancing. I want you to understand that it doesn't end in the nighttime. It doesn't end in the evening. Whatever you're facing right now, it's not going to be the end of the day, but the end of the day is going to be the light and the joy and the peace and the strength and everything you've been seeking after. He said, you heard me and you healed me. Bow your heads with me here this morning. I cried in the night. I sought for you in the night. And you heard my cry. You separated darkness from light. You created light out of the very darkness. Evening and morning. Evening and morning. Let me just tell you something. Your day is not going to end with hurt. Your day is not going to end with pain. Your day is not going to end with suffering. Your day is going to end with the peace and the strength and the joy of the Lord in your life. Turn my morning into joyful dancing. The clothes of mourning clothe me with joy. That I might sing praises to you and not be silent. I will give you thanks forever. So here as we pray this morning, this is what I ask you here today. I ask you that if you can be honest with yourself today. You have been firing away at life. Not having any target to aim for. You've just been randomly firing off. I'm not sure which direction to go. I'm not sure which way I should go. I'm not sure what I should do next. I'm, I'm unsure of what is ahead of me. I'm, I'm worried about what tomorrow may hold. If I, if I make this decision, what is it going to do to me tomorrow? If I make this choice, what is it going to do to me tomorrow? Let me just explain something to you as best I can. When you decide to live your life on purpose and live it for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you never have to worry about what tomorrow holds because the Word tells you that He holds your tomorrow. I don't know what to do next. I don't know what's going to happen next. Live your life on purpose. Follow after Him and you'll never have to question what comes next. Quit trying to make your own choices and your own decisions and begin to live life on purpose. Quit trying to decide how it's going to work out and just live your life on purpose. And my purpose is that I will bring joy to the King of Kings, that I will bring praises to the Lord of Lords because He has guided me and protected me and held me. Live my life on purpose. So maybe you're a guest here today for the first time and hearing this for the first time. We invite you to come today. Nobody's going to pressure you into anything, but we invite you to come and just talk to the Lord here today. You talk to Him just like you would talk to somebody standing in front of you. God, I need you. God, I have no direction. I have no focus. I have no purpose in life. God, I've run around aimlessly trying to figure out what to do next, and I need direction. I need guidance, and I need focus. God, I need to live my life on purpose. So the altar is open for you today, or... Maybe you're just a saint of God that's been walking around trying to just figure out what's next and what's my calling and what should I be doing and where should I be. Maybe, maybe you've questioned all of those things. Well, this morning is the morning that you make a decision just to simply follow God with purpose. I'm going to live my life on purpose. If I live my life on purpose, then God, you are going to open the doors. And when you open the doors, I'll walk through the doors. But I'm going to quit. <coughs> trying to kick doors down I'm going to walk through open doors and so God I'm going to do what's difficult for me to do and that is wait on you until you open that door God I'm going to wait on you until you open that door that's the difficult part we have is learning how to wait upon the Lord but the scripture says those who wait upon the Lord will receive their strength they're going to mount up with wings as eagles you got to have purpose. you got to have direction. And you got to have focus. And the only place you receive it is when you're in a relationship with God Almighty. And so I open this altar today saying, oh God, why don't you come? I need to redirect myself today. God, I need to repurpose myself today. 
God, I need to make my calling and my election sure today. God, I need to have confidence in my walk with you today. I'm tired of roaming around aimlessly, but I'm going to get direction. I'm going to get purpose, and I'm going to get focus. Come on, it's all right. It doesn't matter today who you are. It doesn't matter today what your situation is. Each and every one of us struggle with this very thing. And before you leave here today, you need to make a decision. I'm going to live my life on purpose. I'm going to live my life on purpose. God, I'm going to continue to step forward. God, I'm going to continue to step through every door you open. God, I'm going to continue to trust you. I'm going to wait upon you, oh God. I'm going to wait upon you. Why don't you come here today? Why don't you come? Why don't you come help somebody else pray here today? Why don't you pray with somebody else who's down here today? Make a decision to live my life on purpose. Come on, some of you are still struggling with what to do next. Some of you are still battling with what to do next. Some of you still can't figure out where I'm supposed to be or what I'm supposed to be doing. Understand that God called you for a purpose. He called you for a time such as this. And I will trust Him. I will trust Him. I will trust Him. Live my life on purpose. Live my life on purpose. Come on. Come on. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. Come on, don't hesitate today. Come on, don't hesitate. I feel the Holy Ghost here right now. I feel the Holy Ghost drawing somebody right now. Come on, you need to respond to the Holy Ghost. You need to respond to that tug on your spirit right now. I got to live on purpose. I've got to live on purpose. 